Okay? Well, the clock says that it's a little after 6, but you know what your body's telling you, don't you? It's a little after 7. That's what it feels like. Same for me. This past Wednesday night, I believe it was this past one or the week before, uh, Raymond used this scripture in his devotional on Wednesday night, which I thought was just really great. And uh, I wanted to show you something about it as we kind of move into tonight's lesson. By the way, there's going to be tonight's lesson and then one more in this series on the Bible. So next week will be the last one. Unless you have some really great questions that you want to give, or you said, I was hoping you were going to cover that, and you didn't, and you want to give it to me, and I'll look at it and say, I left it out on purpose, or I'll uh, try to figure out a good answer for you. So if you have a question or something on your mind that was not answered, then be sure and bring that up to me, and I will try to work it in in two weeks. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Literally, this, these two words, or this idea of rightly dividing, literally means to dissect. It means to cut up properly, or to apportion correctly. As if you were cutting up a pie, and you wanted it to be the pieces to all be the same, and so you were cutting it or dissecting it correctly, just how you want it to be. The NIV says correctly handling, the ESV rightly handling, and the American Standard Version says, handling aright. Really, in this instance, I think the King James Version has a, a pretty good handle on this idea of dissecting or cutting or dividing it correctly. So the better that we understand or divide or apportion correctly the Bible, the more equipped we will be to know God and to know His will for us. And that's been really the purpose of this series of lessons. Now I showed you these two slides when we began our very first lesson. Throughout these lessons we have considered why are there so many translations and which one is the best, which ones are the best. How were the books of the Bible selected and how were those decisions made? In what languages was the Bible written and why is this important? Why was it forbidden for centuries for the Bible to be translated into English? How did we get the English Bible? And some left to come. How is the Bible organized? What's the timeline of the Bible? Why is this important? Who added the chapters and verses, which we'll cover tonight? And what is the central theme of the Bible? And why should we not lose sight of it? have a few more ideas that are not in this list for next week's lesson. Here then are the, the ideas or the topics for tonight. Chapters and verses... Someone asked me this question uh, as a couple of weeks ago, so I added it into tonight's lesson. And that is, what about those footnotes that you find in, the, in your Bible sometimes? It says, well, this verse was left out. Uh, uh, what, or older manuscripts say this, and why were they not included? We're going to look at that tonight. And then we're going to also do the central theme of, of the Bible in tonight's lesson. Let's talk about chapters for a minute. The chapters that were selected, this is going to be a lot of information. don't expect you to remember all of it. We'll go through it kind of quickly. But I just wanted you to see how chapters and verses were added to the Bible. Originally, the first versions of the Bible had neither chapters nor verses. Imagine how difficult that would be in Bible study. Turn to the book of Isaiah. Uh, go to that paragraph, uh, the... 23rd paragraph or go to this certain area and try to find it, it would be difficult. Of course, people weren't walking around with a lot of copies, but it would be difficult, more difficult to find locations in order to study together. The Hebrew Bible was divided into sections which allowed parts to be read over a period of three years without repetition. And by the 4th century AD, the New Testament was divided into topical sections. Eusebius of Caesarea divided the Bible into parts. In the early 13th century, Cardinal Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langdon, developed a systematic divisions of the Bible, which would become the chapters that we know today. We think about the verses that are in the Bible. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, had a system of special punctuation, like colons, and it's these sentence breaks which printing press later duplicated and they became the verses. In the, in the New Testament we have a couple of individuals 
The first one in 1551, a man named Robert Estony, a French printer, created a system of sentences in his edition of the Greek New Testament. And in 1555, Estony published a version of the Latin Vulgate, which became the first Bible edition to have the verses, numbers, incorporated into the text. Before this date, they had been in the margins. We're almost done with this section. We'll do some fun statistics in a minute. In 1557, William Whittingham translation was the first English Bible with verses. And in 1560, which is kind of the, the date to remember, the famous Geneva Bible was the first English language Bible to include both chapters and verses as we know them today. This Bible is the one used by Shakespeare, John Knox, Oliver Cromwell, John, John Donne, and William Bunyan. The Geneva Bible's chapters and verses have been used in all English language Bibles since, and the vast majority of those in other languages. So it wasn't until 1560, that's pretty late, recent more to our times, that chapters and verses were added to, to the Bible. It's important for us to know these were added by men. And so if I'm sure themes were tried to be taken into consideration, but there might be an odd place at times where there's a chapter break, or there's a, a, a verse that's kind of that looks like it shouldn't be uh, where, it's, where it belongs. Just remember that that's not a God-ordained section break in the scriptures. That was done by a man or by men to help us in our Bible reading and studying together. And we're thankful for them for it. This is a, a copy of the Geneva Bible, which was the first, the first one, as I noted. Uh, look at the, the way that the spelling is there in this heading at the bottom left. The Holy Gospel of Jesus Christ according to John. Try to read a lot of that. That would be pretty difficult, wouldn't it, to try to read uh, a 1560 English here are some statistics, and this may seem like a trivial pursuit kind of a thing, but it, it's just interesting to see how it all um, divides out. There are 929 chapters in the Old Testament, and then you can see there the way they're divided up between the Pentateuch, historical books, poetic books, the major and minor prophets, which we will actually spend a little time talking about next, next week. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament, 89 in the Gospels, 28 in Acts, 87 in all the Pauline epistles minus Hebrews, and 34 in the general epistles, including Hebrews, and 22 chapters in Revelation. A little more uh, information, a total of 1,189 chapters on average, 18 chapters per book. Psalm 117, the shortest chapter is also the middle chapter of the Bible being the 595th chapter, if you go just by chapters. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter of the Bible. You probably knew that already. And five books are a single chapter, Obadiah, Philemon, 2 John, 3 John, Jude. In many printed editions, the chapter number is omitted for these books, and it's just simply, you might just say, Jude, verse 3. As far as verses go, this is the last slide on this. There are 23,145 verses in the Old Testament and 7,957 verses in the New Testament, which gives a total of 31,102 verses. In the King James Version, the middle verses are Psalm 103 between uh, verses 1 and 2. That's the middle of the Bible if you go by verses. Okay, You can now go home and you can impress all your friends. John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept is the shortest verse in most English translations, followed very nearly by 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, which says rejoice always. It's also a very short one. And Esther 8 and verse 9 is the longest verse. That's the way it's divided up by verses. Now, bottom line is this. The chapters and verses were added by men in order to make the Bible more referenceable and more practical in our study together. It was done in the 16th century, and we benefit from their work to divide it up in ways that make it easier for us to study. 
chapters and verses. Number two, footnotes and manuscripts. Now, if you've been asleep so far, this is a good time to wake up because this one's going to take a little bit of thought. Some modern translations move certain verses to footnotes or set them apart with an explanation such as this one from John 7, the end of 7, and chapter 8 in the NIV. It says this, The earliest and most reliable manuscripts do not have John 7, 53 through 8, 11. And then that's the end of the quotation. This is the event of the woman caught in the act of adultery. If you look in modern translations, most all of them will have this set apart and have an explanation like this, either at the top of the page or mark and with a reference and footnote at the bottom of the page. I was a little surprised by this. If you go to the next slide, you, you can see 16 times there's omitted verses that we can find, uh, and all of them are listed here. Matthew 17, 21, Matthew 18, 11, there might be just a word that's different or, or missing. Uh, and others o- omitted verses, uh, go back to the last one. Uh, on the right side there, you see Matthew 20, 16, and, and on. There's, there's some that are omitted. Let's go to the next slide now. Others include, in Mark chapter 16, if you turn to your NIV Bible or any more modern translation, you will find uh, that this section that's Mark 16, 9 through 20, which is the Great Commission, Mark's Great Commission, including that section on the handling of snakes and the drinking deadly poison, that's all in that section. It's set apart um, as a as a separate section. And then, and then this one in Acts chapter 8, verse 36, I'm always looking for this one when I read the NIV, and I, I don't know where it is, and I have to find it in the footnote. But this is where Philip and the eunuch, at the eunuch's conversion, it's where he says, here's water, what doth hindereth me to be baptized? And he says uh, this part, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Um, so if you're reading along and you get to Acts chapter 8, you read verse 35, the next one after it's verse 37. There is no 36. And then you look at the footnote, and it is down there. Now, why are these omitted or moved to the footnotes? In order to answer this question, we must first establish a truth. The oldest manuscripts, follow closely. I'm going to have to read this one twice. The oldest manuscripts, that is the oldest copies of the book of the Bible, the one closest to the time that the book was originally written by the pen of the author is the most reliable. We can read that. The one that was the, is the oldest, the one that's nearest to the time when the person wrote. There's no original available. There's no, the ink was written by, the, the, by Isaiah. Uh, there's, no, there's not one available. But the copies were made throughout the, throughout the centuries and years. And the one that's closest to the one that Isaiah wrote is going to be the one we want because it's the closest to the original one. That's the truth we're going to go with. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So here's my handy-dandy graph that I've, that I've uh, drawn here. We'll start with the, at the left. So the little dot at the left The original writing of a book, let's say the book of Isaiah, that's when it was written. We go along through time, and we get to to time period A. It's just arbitrary. This is not to scale, it's just to illustrate. And we have the oldest known copy of Isaiah available. It's available there at time A. And as you go along the timeline, you see when the King James Version was about to be written, which copy would they use in order to make uh, write Isaiah and translate it into English. Well, they'll use the A that's available because it's the one closest to the time Isaiah wrote that they had at the time when the King James Version was written. But now we go on through time. We get to time period B. Let's say something like the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered with a copy of the book of Isaiah that's found. But the benefit of that is it's... Back preceding A, it's older than A, even though it was discovered in a more modern time. So it's a newer discovery, but an older copy. And so that's the one we want to use. So the modern translations of the Bible, then, will have older manuscripts to use in order to translate the Bible into English 
than what was known or available in 1611 when the King James Version was, was translated. And so when we get to the NIV then, they use copy B and not copy A because it's older. Do I need to say all that again? Everybody got it? Okay, good. Some of the newest discoveries then, the oldest manuscripts, they have minor variations from the ones that, that were known. The older manuscripts don't have certain verses that the modern ones had. So when they found more recent discoveries of older texts, they didn't have certain things in them that were in the ones that we have now. And since our established truth is that the oldest manuscripts are the most reliable, these additions were removed or put down to footnotes. Oh, I see question mark faces. I'm sorry. Okay, let's see if I can do this again. So, the oldest manuscripts are the most reliable. The newer ones had things in it that were different. A few minor things that were different. So, when they found the older ones, those minor new things that were in it were moved to the footnotes. Because we want the ones that are most like the originals. Now, why are there additions? And should we be concerned? That's what you want to know, isn't it? I do too. In an earlier lesson, I showed the amazing work of scribes who painstakingly hand-copied the Bible over thousands of years. To think about the intricacies of the Hebrew text with its jots and tittles and how a single little mark made such a difference in the understanding of a word or what a word was, it's amazing and obviously God-blessed that throughout all time, with the thousands of copies that were made, that there were so few errors or, or additions, we might say maybe not errors, but so few uh, differences, added, added, minor variations. Sometimes well-meaning scribes would add an explanation to the text, which accounts for a lot of these minor additions uh, to the most current text. So let's say that a, a scribe, is, is, he's, he's writing and he writes in a little addition, a little fact or something to help clarify it. And in doing so, for all time, he changes the copies that are in the future. It is thought that scribes, due to their immense knowledge of the scriptures, would borrow information, let's say from another synoptic gospel, to complete the story or add details to it. And although, although well-meaning, these scribes detracted from the purity of the gospel as it was originally written. So I'm going to give you an example of this. At least it appears to be an example. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the, the text here is about hypocritical teachers of the law. In Matthew chapter 13, 14 is, is omitted in the NIV. Okay, it's one of those that's, that's been moved to a footnote. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. So let's say that, that you're, you're a scribe and, and you're copying along and you know what Luke says. And so as you're writing along and you're writing the book of Matthew out, you know what Luke says because in Luke twenty forty seven it adds, They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Not in the oldest ones that we have, but in the newer ones. So it's thought that some scribe who was well-meaning went over to Luke in Luke 20, 47, knowing that's where it fits and wrote it in there when it originally wasn't there. Well-meaning, but misguided. This next section, um, Larry Keener will appreciate because it's one of his favorite authors, Wayne Jackson from the Christian Courier. He's talking about the King James Version. While the King James Version is a reliable translation and certainly adequate for learning the truth of the gospel, arriving in heaven, serious students know that numerous additional ancient resources have gone into constructing the more modern Greek text. Basically, it's just saying that older copies have been found since 1611. 
thousands of manuscripts and many fragments, much older than those employed by the King James translators, have been discovered and incorporated into modern texts. Whoa. Many early church fathers quoted sections of the Bible. I think this is a really pretty neat fact. If you look at writers in the first 200 years after the apostles, many of them would quote from the scriptures. They would say, they would quote from parts of the, the gospels. And, in their, and so you can look and see what they wrote and to compare it. And there's so many of those that you almost have the whole New Testament found in their writings that can be compared then with the text to help restore the reliability of the text. And then finally, from Wayne Jackson's materials, significant advances have been made in the study of, the, of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek languages during the past 200 years. We have a, a better understanding, a deeper understanding, more intensified study of it in, in modern times. Now, if this topic has piqued your interest, this is not exhaustive. I may not have answered your question completely. If it's something that you're interested in, do your own study. Look into it yourself and uh, let me know what you find. We'll work on this together. Number three, and finally for tonight, the central theme of the Bible. Sometimes we become so interested in the various stories and events of the Bible that we lose sight of the singular message of the Bible as a whole. It's one of those things that I appreciate about my father-in-law's film series is that he wanted to have a series that would teach the total story of the Bible. Although it's made up of individual events, there is a central message to the Bible. And the central theme of the Bible is Jesus. He is the theme of the Bible, the central theme. In teaching from the book of Revelation, we started in upstairs today. I know the auditorium has been studying for several weeks. I was reacquainted with these wonderful passages from Revelation chapter 1. As we think about the central theme of the Bible being Jesus, consider these words. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Wow. That is fantastic. You'd be hard pressed to find a more exalting passage of Jesus than this one. He is the theme of the Bible. The Bible's central theme is essentially God's plan for redeeming man through Jesus. It is God working through his people to bring his Messiah, Jesus, who would save the world from their sins. God created man. Man fell. God redeemed by Jesus. Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus will be. Back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, who was, and is to come. The Almighty. The Alpha being the beginning of the Greek alphabet. The Omega, the end of the Greek alphabet. It is as if Jesus is saying, I am the A to Z. I am everything. I was before time. I am in time. I am after time. I'm the Almighty. The Bible contains the words of life, and we can have confidence in it. God has preserved his will for us that we may read it, obey it, and live eternally. Next week, we will consider a few more items, and then this, this series will be concluded. Uh, if you didn't, if there was in that midsection that was a little difficult, um, hopefully we're going to have these.
posted and available online pretty soon. You can go back and listen to it again if you need to. Um, anybody who's interested, I'm not going to compile a list beginning tonight, but I will gladly make available all these PowerPoints. I can email them to you and have them available to you for your own personal study. And I will compile those and have them ready so that at the end of the series, you can take them home. You can look at them again. Uh, you can see them as you listen to the audio if you'd like to, that, the, that they're recording. So you can review it because it's, it's a lot of information. But you'll be blessed by knowing how to handle the word of truth. If you'd like to respond tonight to the Lord's invitation, He is the Almighty. Come as we stand and sing. <laughs>